uh, time work, or is it time? Time. Time? Right. Yeah. I'm going to do one slap for any expected time. At six minutes, I'll do another slap. At seven minutes, I'll do two. And at seven minutes, 15, I'm going to be doing it. All right, sounds good. <laughs> There's a certain age for everybody when they're first exposed to a glimpse of the horrible atrocities of war. For me, this was ninth grade in history class. I was watching a documentary on World War I. And we saw a clips, or some clips of trench warfare. And they went into the horrible reality that our soldiers had to endure. That was the first time that I ever felt utterly disturbed. So much so that I wanted to vomit. And I've only felt that a few more times in the rest of my life. Now that continued on in World War II. Once again, terrible, terrible war. Utter atrocities that are disgusting to even talk about. But since then, though we have had wars, we have had brutal, terrible wars, but never have we had such a death toll as we had in World War I and World War II. And why is that? Us on the government side propose that that is because of nuclear weapons, which is why we believe that, the, that nuclear weapons have ultimately done more good than harm. To start off, let us briefly bring up a weighing mechanism, a criterion for how we can prove that these have actually done more good than harm. And ultimately, since this is a method of war, we believe that the weighing mechanism should be lives saved. Lives saved specifically by utilitarian calculus, meaning that if we compare the world in which we do have nuclear weapons versus a world in which we don't. We ultimately have more, or we have less loss of life in the, wor in the world in which we have a uh, nuclear weapon. I believe that that will prove for the government side that we have shown that uh, nuclear weapons have done more good than harm. So today we're going to be looking at the escalation of war. We're going to be seeing how war has progressively gotten worse throughout history and how nuclear weapons have remarkably been able to mitigate some of those atrocities. Secondly, we're also going to be looking at the consequences of nuclear weapons, but how really those out, uh, that those consequences are outweighed by the good that it has done. And then finally, my partner will be getting into her split in other goods scientifically that we have gained through nuclear weapons. So starting first with the escalation of war. Now throughout history, the way warfare has gone is we've advanced in technology. Everyone's trying to go for technology that's better at killing. You start off with the arrow, then you, or you start off with a sword, then you get the arrow, then you get a musket, then you have a rifle, and it continues on until we get finally to World War I, where we have tanks, where we have machine guns, where we have mustard gas. This is the first time chemical weapons actually inter or introduced themselves. At the end of this terrible war, people agreed that this was so devastating that we should never uh, have a war like this again. That's why. Uh, there was the first coalition of nations uh, that was the predecessor to the United Nations was formed. Ultimately, that failed, however. But before I get on to my next point, I'll take you. So in the post-World War II uh, you know, climate politically, um, what would be the conditions that would cause a potential World War III if you're saying nuclear weapons or stall the incidents? Of I'll, I'll be getting into that. Don't worry. I'm just going through the history here. Uh, so now we get into World War II. Again, even worse, even a higher death toll. Once again, because of a new escalation in technology. Technology made specifically to kill. Now at the end of that, we have the worst atrocity that has probably ever been seen throughout human history. Specifically the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Now that alone was, the, the death there is hard to really calculate. It's hard to weigh that against a world in which we never invented However, look at the result. As a result, we have now mutually assured destruction. We have reasons in which, for example, the United States and Russia and China can never go to war without the knowledge that is going to utterly decimate both countries, a risk in which they simply do not want to take. That's why, for example, in the Cold War, though there were plenty of other proxy wars that came out of that, ultimately, we never got into a full-scale battle with Russia. The two largest superpowers in the world never actually clashed, which would have been another devastating death toll that would have been just as worse if, or would have been just as bad, if not progressively worse, than the other world war. Do you disagree? If North Korea were to launch a missile right now, right, and we don't know how far away they are from pushing that button, what do you think the consequences of that would be? The consequences of a nuclear weapon? Yeah. Well, obviously it would be devastating to the United States. 
or going, but I've shown you specifically how that has not happened. So now let's talk specifically more about this. So we have mutually assured destruction, which is stopping these huge superpowers from attacking each other. We can see this in the application of the Cold War. Now, of course, you want to weigh that against the death that has been caused by nuclear weapons. And once again, I want to reiterate that the death that has been caused specifically when we dropped them on the Japanese people was utterly devastating, it was a terrible, terrible action. But it has never happened again since then. These weapons have only ever been used that one time. And since then, the world has been free of that destruction and been free of the destruction of the largest superpowers engaging in head-on conflicts. Now secondly, we can go into specifically, I, I believe what he was alluding to, which is the fear of nuclear weapons. Now this is the direct consequence. We can see this really in the Cold War also with the threats from North Korea, where people had to live in fear constantly for their lives. And, all, and ultimately this does bring down uh, the prosperity of one's life. This is a terrible thing to have to live with. That's why it was a terrible uh, place during the Cold War. However, we on the government side believe that living in fear is superior than death. That if I have to live, live in my country in fear that I'm going to be killed by a nuclear weapon from another country, that that is far better than being drafted and having to be sent into War. Specifically, this would probably be very much like World War I and World War II. We'd have trench warfare again, these terrible, terrible atrocities. We have mitigated this, and in trade, we have even fear. And like we've said, fear is terrible. It's not good to live in fear, but it's better than the death toll that has been mitigated by this. So what are we seeing today in the government side? Well, I first showed you the criteria. The criteria are a weighing mechanism in which we can say, how do we know that nuclear weapons have done more good than harm? And that is lives that have been saved. And I've shown you then how war has escalated throughout history. How for quite some time, every war was more and more devastating because the technology developed until after, after nuclear weapons. Suddenly, the largest superpowers could no longer come together and fight it out. And for that reason, <coughs> nuclear weapons have done more good than harm. And we are proud to propose. Thank you. atrocities, huge atrocities to the fact that we have never really seen before. And that's the reason that on the opposition, we believe that that type of power to level a city, that type of power to kill so many people is something that should never be in the hands of any individual, any country, any irrational leader. So rather than continuously saying it's a terrible thing so we should keep it so maybe there's a deterrent effect, we should realize that the possibility of that ever being used is something that's even more atrocious than it actually being used in the first place. That is what instills fear upon other individuals and encourages the ability to use those type of weapons in the future. So within this speech, I'm going to do a couple of things. First, I'm going to go over the arguments that the government just brought up to you. Then I'm going to bring up our first two arguments about how it's too much power in the hands of the country, and our second argument that it's too much power in the hands of irrational leaders and terrorist organizations. My, my partner is going to bring up to you our final argument about failure of the deterrence theory through cost-benefit analysis. So let's take a look at their arguments. They say that we should evaluate the round through a utilitarian perspective. All right, that's fine. Let's take a look at who's actually going to save the most amount of lives. Their first argument is that there's an escalation of war. They bring to you the idea that there's advancement in technology and that after the bombing of Nagasaki and Hiroshima, we never really saw such a bad thing again. So there's two problems with this that we have. The first is that mutually assured destruction only works when we're evaluating two individual organizations or groups or countries that are rational. When there's an irrational player in the mix, that's when that mutually assured destruction goes out the window. It's no longer a, oh, well, if I use a nuclear weapon against you, it's going to harm you, so I don't want to be harmed in the same way. It's, I don't have a national border. I do not have a country. I don't care if I use a nuclear weapon against you because you can use, you can't really use it against me. I have no defined individual area that I exist. So when irrational leaders get thrown into the mix, that mutually assured destruction goes out the window. Second, mutually assured destruction either works 
and countries under their same logic of technological advancement will only advance even more to get a new technological upper hand, or it doesn't work, in which case we have large-scale nuclear war, or even just a nuclear weapon being put off and killing lots of people. That's not a bet that we want to take, and we don't want either situation in the world of the opposition. Their second argument is that there is a fear of nuclear weapons, and that fear is a good thing. But fear is bad when we allow for big countries or big Western countries or any big entity to bully smaller countries simply because they have the fear of nuclear weapons behind them. That sort of thing is what allows oppressive na an oppressive nature from, or from country to country. And we also don't like that fear when that fear comes from uh, terrorist organizations and we legitimize that terrorist organization that was small in the first place because they have the ability to access them, those nuclear weapons. That's when fear is not so great. So let's talk about our first two arguments on our side of the house. First, we see that it's too much power in the hands of individuals. And so what we see is that nuclear weapons have the chance to wipe out entire cities. We understand that on both sides of the house. And that's something that with the click of the button, that's too much power to put in the hands of anyone. So I'm going to give you a few examples of this. So first, nuclear weapons could wipe out cities. The United States, for example, has enough ICBMs in order to wipe out basically the majority of the map. That's not a very great idea or thought to have in our mind. So the ability and just having those nuclear weapons in the first place and the ability to use them if we were to get too mad at some country like China, then that's not necessarily a great option. And we don't want to take that type of risk in the world of the opposition. Second, there is the potential of accidents. We saw through, through North Carolina when a plane broke in half and nuclear weapons almost hit the ground. Those sorts of things and accidents do happen. And what we see is that when those accidents happen on the other side of the pond, when Iran literally said that they would want to wipe other countries off of the map, then those accidents actually turn into war. They turn into nuclear war if there's the potential, or they simply turn into larger wars. But regardless, we see a loss of lives. All right, third, there could be bullying of one country to another. For example, if larger countries like the United States could have like, had nuclear weapons and wanted to use them against smaller states, then they could push other individual states under their thumb of hard power and simply say, you should fear us, so you should obey us. Otherwise, we'll use a nuclear weapon against you. That sort of idea and the potential for that to happen in the future is not something that's great because that only increases the ability for it to actually be used. So what's the impact of this? First, we see that it's morally wrong that any individual entity can have the power to wipe out a city off the map, but also there's potential and too large of a potential to actually use those nuclear weapons and be able to harm other individuals simply because we want them to fear us or simply because there was an accident that occurred. So those sort of, sort of things mean that we have a large probability of a large amount of lives being lost. So before I go into my second point, I'd love to take a few eyes. Okay, so it's a good thing that the United States with our nuclear weapons has never bullied a smaller country with our conventional forces. It's a good thing that's never happened. All right, so maybe that's not a great thing either, but this debate is about nuclear weapons and the potential for that to happen in the future with any large country, Western or any large country in general against a smaller country is not okay. That's not something that we stand behind on the opposition side of the house. Second argument, too much power in the hands of irrational leaders and terrorist organizations. Groups we don't want to get nuclear weapons actually have the chance to get them, and it's a little bit higher of a probability than we'd like to think in today's society. And they try to use those in order to get the upper hand and, be, and have other individuals fear them in the future. So first, how does this happen? Irrational leaders can obtain nuclear weapons. Here's a couple ways how. For example, in the past couple of years in California, facilities shut down and everything was completely black for a little bit, for about two hours. That time period is when or when like bombs, nuclear weapons, could have been stolen very easily. That's an instance where terrorist organizations could steal nuclear weapons. Also, they could build nuclear weapons. There's lots of bomb, like, bomb makers in terrorist organizations, and it's very easy to pay them off in order to make a nuclear weapon, or any weapon for that matter. Lastly, they could simply buy off nuclear weapons from countries through the black market, or simply try to get to the smaller, lower level governmental officials and try to lead their way into getting a nuclear weapon in the future. They also have religious reasons to use them. Jihadists want to wipe out other countries and want to wipe out other individuals off the map. They have an incentive to do this. But terrorist organizations generally want to kill other people anyways and, want to, and only want to pursue their propaganda. So they want to use this to harm other individuals. And this is what legitimizes their power. That fear that, that the government brings up is what legitimizes the power of terrorist organizations. If ISIS got a nuclear weapon, then we would have to start taking ISIS a whole lot more seriously. 
If a small terrorist organization had a nuclear weapon, we'd have to take them a lot more seriously. So that spreads terrorism that has the potential to kill lots of people. And remember, that kills a lot of people. That's how we're evaluating this debate. So it's too much power in the hands of the individual. It's too much power in the hands of irrational leaders. So mutually assured destruction and fear of nuclear weapons no longer works. Never on this side of the house will you hear us ever approving the things that happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Never will you hear us saying, hey, maybe we should use more nuclear weapons. No, that's not something we're going to sign for. But we're saying that when we have used them, the results they produced are better, are, have produced more good than harm. Now, I'm just going to address a little bit of what the previous speaker brought up in her speech. And then um, I'm going to do a little bit of case rebuilding about mutually assured destruction that my partner brought up. And then I'm going to get into my split about the... The, that, the advancements in the scientific community after what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So um, the previous speaker brings up about things about how like we shouldn't live in a state of fear, but I mean, we think fear is a good thing. The world is a scary place and we should be afraid. In a world where ISIS exists, in a world where Boko Haram exists, in a world where terrorist organizations in general and other things exist, we should be afraid. And we think that if you can deter like mass warfare by scaring other countries, we think that's a good thing because we don't believe we don't think all-out warfare is good. We don't, want, we don't want another world war, and we don't want a world in which that kind of possibility is, is possible, which is why um, Brandon brings up this thing about mutually assured destruction. If you start nuclear warfare and the country you're fighting has nuclear weapons, they're likely to retaliate. And if you have that, then you're likely to have another retaliation. And what you have is essentially a lot of nuclear warfare that leads to mutually assured destruction, not just of those two countries, but possibly of humankind. And nobody wants the end of humankind, so obviously no one's going to engage in all that nuclear warfare, which is a, which is what his whole point was about that side opposition seemed to have just clearly missed. Now, they also bring up this point about like bullying and how like countries shouldn't be able to bully smaller ones by saying, oh, we're gonna like shoot nuclear weapons at you. But again, as Brandon said before, if those countries do indeed have access to nuclear weapons, as you stated, they're not going to engage in nuclear warfare because of how detrimental it is. We've seen the, 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 the problems it creates, and we've seen all of the people it can, it can kill even, even way after because of things like radiation poisoning. But that's not necessarily a reason to say that like, oh, these possibilities like may, like can occur, but like they haven't. In the, in the time that has passed since then. And so you can't just say that like, oh yeah, that's like, that takes on your whole case. No, not right now. And like thirdly on your point about legitimizing terrorist organizations like ISIS, you don't need to legitimize a terrorist organization for them to kill people. They will do it regardless of whether or not the international community recognizes them or not. And like whether or not they're legitimized, if they can get access to nuclear weapons, they will do it. Legitimizing them has nothing to do with that. So, I mean like, ult like ultimately your case doesn't really stand because we're talking about like something that actually happened and the, and the benefits that it's caused. And what you're ultimately doing is playing in hypotheticals that don't we don't really see ever happening in real life. Uh, but before I continue into my split, I will take Bob. Okay, so if uh, countries recognize that they're never going to use nuclear weapons, why is the case that um, major players in the United States and Russia have not significantly decreased their stockpiles and are still creating ABMs as we talk? Because it's always good to have backup plans. Like it's it's fine. <laughs> like ultimately, if you have like enough, ultimately it's a, it's a power play, right? Like if you have more than they do, and if you are able to say, hey, like this is what this could possibly escalate to, they're not more, they're not, they're less likely to engage in something that could get even more exponentially dangerous. Like if you increase the risk of danger and you increase like just how much damage it can cause, people are less likely to say like, hey, maybe we should engage in nuclear warfare now that the stakes are greater. No, it just doesn't work that way. So I'm gonna get to my split about the scientific following effects of what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So after what happened, like it was horrible. We're not going to argue that like decimating hundreds of thousands of people was ever a good thing and it should never happen again. And we totally condemn what what um, the U.S. did um, all those years ago. But what did we see after? We saw spurred medical, environmental, and energy-related research in those fields. How does that directly connect to um, nuclear weapons? So within the medical field, there needed to be an immediate response to all of the victims of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They were affected in ways that were unique to radioactive energy, to nuclear energy. 
So this spurred medical research, on, medical research on the effects of radiation on the human body and how to mitigate those types of injuries. Now, that's not to say like, oh yeah, now we're prepared for when there's nuclear warfare. No, what that prepares us for is when there are uh, when there are damages to other people who have been harmed by the effects of radiation. When do we see that happen? For, exa for example, in Chernobyl, when things like that happen, we will have knowledge of how to address those injuries and how to address people who have suffered from the effects of negative of uh, radiation, um, who have harmed them from like accidents, essentially. And we can help people who suffer from so similar injuries without necessarily having to talk about like, oh, there's going to be nuclear warfare. No. So in a day and age when we don't have full grasp of the balance of nuclear energy, we don't have full control over it, and in a day and age where things like Chernobyl can happen, and accidents can happen, we want to be prepared to address those things, um, period. So secondly, on to, like in the, within the field of environmental research, radioactivity has extremely detrimental effects on our environment in terms of deteriorating the ozone layer, uh, subsequent climate change. But what this did is it spurred environmental research to ameliorate these effects. How so? So one of man's greatest motivators, I think we can all agree, is fear. People are very motivated by fear, money, hunger, but in this case, we're going to talk about fear. Living in fear of environmental damage, essentially your planet being wiped out, we think is pretty motivating. Environmental changes affect everybody. It's not just, you know, it's not just like the person in SoCal who's like, oh, it's kind of like hotter than it usually is. No, it's everybody in the world because we all live on the same planet. It's people and businesses on coastal areas whose sea levels are rising, who are being pushed inwards, who are being forced to urbanize. It's people like that who climate change is affecting. And, um, and ultimately, like, environmental research is to help those people as well as like, everyone else on the planet. Because you know, I'd like to think that environmental researchers like to benefit the, like, the global community, not just themselves. So ultimately, what you have, oh, sorry, I need to get to my next one. And you also have um, energy-related research, right? So when you have like things that happen within the new, uh, within like things about nuclear energy, you have people learning about that. And, and when we need to start separating our ties um, economically to the Middle East, to places like Southern America, when it comes to oil, when we need to have new forms of energy that are more sustainable, nuclear energy is a great field to look into because it could possibly be much more sustainable. But if we just say, hey, we're gonna like shut down nuclear programs, or, or if we never had nuclear weapons in the first place and we couldn't um, like see the effects energy-wise then we ultimately wouldn't be able to um, do this kind of research and be able to possibly in the future separate ourselves economically from um, other countries and be able to have our own sustainable energy supply. So for these reasons, um, we are proud to uh, propose. Mr. Speaker, before I get into my constructive case, I'd just like to go over some rebuttal of what we just heard from the previous speaker, right? Now, we see from opening government that they have this essentially flawed idea of what utilitarianism is, right? Because they try to state that, you know, having nuclear weapons and all of this has, you know, utilitarian benefits. But at a point where a nuclear weapon is launched and you kill millions of people, at that point, Mr. Speaker, there is no utilitarian benefit to having nuclear weapons because you have destroyed a lot of lives, right? And they seem to assume that nuclear, weapon, nuclear warfare will never happen, right? That it's mutually destructive, but that it will never occur. And we say that that is essentially false. And my previous speaker brought this up. We see that in the case of terrorist organizations, right? Have, should, they, should they be able to get access to a nuclear weapon? The fact is we don't know how far away they are from a push of a button that could lead to a nuclear uh, war, right? And we see that this problem has occurred in previous wars too, right? When it comes to World War I, there were several different factors, right? Really um, different factors, all like really really sort of fragile that led to the, to the creation of war. And this happens so often, right? It happened in World War II also, right? Which means that there is a possibility that something fragile could result in a nuclear weapon being launched too. That is a fear that we need to acknowledge. Something that they seem to think does not matter in this debate, right? They also come up with this essentially sort of fascist ideology that we should be afraid. No, 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 Mr. Speaker. We assure you that people should not have to live in a fear of what's going on, right? There was a point during the Cold War where people heard Sputnik on their um, TV screens and were afraid for their lives. We do not want people in society believing in, like, you know, living in such fear, right? What kind of life is that? What kind of quality of life is that? When you are living in irrational fear of the fact that you could be dead 
because of a nuclear missile exploding in your backyard the next day. No, we do not say that fear is good. We say that fear is bad. Fear should not exist to such a large extent when you have these nuclear weapons, right? Now, they say that nobody's going to engage in nuclear warfare because they understand the repercussions of it. We say no. Why? Let's look back at terrorist organizations, right? You have suicide bombers. They kill themselves in order to propagate what they want, right? Who's to say that they will not launch a nuclear weapon by the same logic, right? They don't care. It's about spreading their ideology. It's about doing all this kind of stuff. And we see that for these reasons, there is very much a threat um, of you know, nuclear warfare, right? And we see that that really can lead to mutually assured destruction. The resolution is that nuclear weapons have done more good than harm, not they could do more good than harm. Also, by the criterion, it's specifically lives saved, not lives that could possibly be endangered. We have to look at practical matters, not just possibilities. No, no, yeah, I'll get to that. I'm going to talk about how they have actually done more harm than good in my constructive case. But I'm just like, I just like to point out right now that when you have these nuclear weapons present in society, they are essentially harmful to, um, to like, our cause. Right now, they also bring up this point about how there's this medical research of radiation, right, and all this stuff that's led to positive benefits when you had. Um, bombs being dropped in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and we see that that is essentially a harm. That research need not have been conducted, none of that need have happened had a bomb not been dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, right? All of this is, a, like, you know, a, a result of nuclear weapon doing harm. We don't necessarily see that as good. We see that as a good that came out of a harm that should not have happened. At that point, we see that flawed logic. We see that these, these problems appear because of nukes and that they should not. Accidents such as Chernobyl, right? This is a harm. This is a tangible harm, right? It led to radiation in the area. Like, you cannot even live in that area right now, right? We see that as a problem. We see that this would not have occurred without nukes. And we see that there is this environmental problem that can be created with, the, um, with having nukes, right? We see that having nuclear weapons does lead to like, these uh, several repercussions and the possibility of mutually assured destruction with um, rational leaders, uh, irrational leaders, sorry. But that really brings me to my argument, which is on the cost benefit analysis of this whole like, situation, right? Now, I'm going to talk about three things. The first is on the reason why we have so many nuclear weapons. The second is on how it's a waste of like taxpayer dollars and money. And the third is on how like deterrence theory really fails, like in this case, right? And we see, okay, let's go back to why we have so many nuclear weapons. Right? We see that it's sort of rooted like quite heavily in Cold War fears, where you know it was more or less an arms race between countries, right? Like in particular the US and Russia, right? And does this sound familiar? Yeah, it does. It was the root cause of World War One. Right? Like one of the root causes of World War I, along with the killing of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, right? the arms race that was occurring in Europe at the time between France and um, Germany and England. Right? And we see that when you have all this, this sort of like arms race going on, and you, when, when you see this sort of potential for threat that can occur, like instantly, instantly, just because of how fragile the situation is. Right? When we look at the Cuban Missile crisis, when we look at how close we were to having all these problems created, we see that nuclear missiles essentially will do harm. Nuclear missiles essentially are not a good thing. Right? And we see that it leads to a situation where we really have too many of these sort of nukes, right? Possibly of mishandling weapons. And we see cases wherein the U.S. has been irresponsible when it comes to taking care of their nukes, right? There was, a, like, as my partner brought up, there was a plane that broke in half over North Carolina where they were lucky to escape a nuclear, like, you know, threat, when in, wherein the nuke failed um, upon hitting the ground. That is a case where we got extremely lucky, where we could very well have seen a state completely destroyed just because of the fact that nukes have not been handled properly, because there are so many of them, and they're, like, they're not really, like, you know, taken care of well. Now we see how it's a harm because it's a waste of taxpayer dollars and money, right? That's kind of a minor point, but I just like to emphasize it. We see that there's a ridiculous amount of money that's like spent on it, right? And it's not really needed by people. At a, at a point where the United States has 5,000 ICBMs, which is enough to create fireworks in our entire solar system, we say that it is always good to have, like, you know, you know, we say that it's not necessarily, like, necessarily, like, great to have these backup plans, especially when you have so many, so many of these nukes, like, so many to a point where they're, like, you know, unnecessary, so many to a point where they can cause so much harm before I go on. So we're not necessarily going to be the team that tells you that nuclear proliferation, as it exists within the status quo, is beneficial, absolutely. But what we are saying is that nuclear weapons, since their inception, have proven more beneficial than they have harmful. That's different from the kind of rhetoric about specifically no, American That's, that's completely where we agree, we disagree, right? We see that nuclear weapons, while, okay, while, like, you know, and I'm going to talk about this, I'm actually going to get to it right now, and, which is like my third point, which is on how deterrence theory fails, right? We see that if everyone has nukes, no one will, will like, use them, right? That's the basic idea of deterrence theory, like one country has nukes, um, you know, so does another country, and so like they're not going to use it because of the fact that you know um, that they, they they believe that they do not want mutually good destruction to occur, right? That's that status quo, right? We see that what, what that really leads to is the fact that this has been such a massive waste of resources, right? Such a massive waste in which you see all these people coming up with nukes that have like really no no purpose, right? And the fact is that at up to this point, when you have them doing like so much harm, like in Chernobyl, like when you have them doing so much harm, like in um, essentially escalating the Cold War. When you have them doing so, like, so much harm in um, the case of like, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, we see that it has done more harm than it does good. And just because at this current stage, right, which is what they're trying to argue, that it has done um, you know, more 
good than it has does have has done harm. That does not mean that in the future it's going to be this case, right? We see how like fragile the situation is. That's what we're really trying to emphasize here, right? And we see that nuclear weapons, even if like you know nuclear weapons will not like right now they do not do more good than they do harm, and in the future they wouldn't either, right? Getting back to the deterrence theory, we see that if it works, what's going to happen, right? If we really believe in deterrence theory, all that leads to is people constantly making like higher powered missiles, right? It leads to the possibility of creation of bio weapons. How bad is that? That is terrible. That is terrible for all of us. We do not want a situation where that occurs, right? And if it fails, right? If deterrence theory really, like, sort of works, we see that it, like, you know, it doesn't lead to a nuclear war. But what happens is that you have this like massive store of um, nuclear weapons, and like if power gets in the wrong hands, as we've already stretched here, right? If power gets in the wrong hands, as it already has with several other uh, types of arms, we feel that this could really lead to more harm than nuclear weapons have done um, so far. Harm that we feel is essentially um, harm that we essentially feel outweighs the good. And for our project. So I'm going to begin with some rebuttal and then I'm going to transition into my positive matter. My three constructive points are going to be uh, spillover benefits, some mutual security benefits, and the calculus of Armageddon and how it relates to conflict resolution. But first and foremost, by beginning with rebuttal, we hear the terrorism argument, we hear a lot of non-state actor rhetoric coming from opening opposition. Let's consider why that's a little ridiculous. Um, ISIS supposedly is just around the corner from getting a nuclear weapon, even though it's headquartered in two states that don't have nuclear weapons. The only people around them that do have nuclear weapons are the Jewish state of Israel, probably not going to be on their kickball team anytime soon, and Iran, which is still working towards that goal. So this non-state actor point is a lot of boogeyman, it's a lot of 90s action movie plots. It doesn't really actually pertain to this debate as we discuss the past impact of nuclear weapons on historical conflicts um, and contemporary politics. So that one doesn't really work. They talk about accidents, they talk about the North Carolina incident. Um, it didn't fail to detonate. Four of the five safeties worked to prevent the bomb from detonating, and this was a 1950s hydrogen bomb in a 1950s bomber plane. But I think our contingencies for safety have gotten a little bit better than 1955, or at least I should hope so. Now, moving on from there, when we look at some of the things that we received from uh, opening opposition, we hear about the amount of money spent, which is an interesting argument, because we also hear this argument about bullying, <coughs> and I brought it up with a POI. What do you think benefits smaller countries more? Do you think it's easier for them to have a nuclear weapon that sits in a warehouse or can script their entire male population to fend off a country 20 times their size? Which one do you think leads to better security? Which one do you think prevents those large countries that they bemoan bullying these little countries, which is what we get from opening opposition, doesn't quite work out. If you have a nuclear weapon, the United States is not going to invade you, which is why North Korea is pretty safe from regime change, because we're not marching Marine soldiers across the DMC so they can get incinerated like that. That's not how it works. And North Korea is not going to launch one nuclear missile at Hawaii that they can barely hit when we can annihilate their entire peninsula. Yes? It's interesting how you continue to say that terrorist organizations can't get nuclear weapons, and you've yet to even answer, and I implore you to answer now, about how they can have bomb makers, they can have, they can buy them off the black market, buy them from government, they can have, they can like steal them from organizations that have just like broken down. Like, what happens then? What happens when a rational leader gets a nuclear weapon? Bad things. I'll get to that in my first constructive point. Uh, but the amount of money spent, the resources that we get to when we talk about this thing, that somehow this empowers larger countries to abuse littler countries, smaller countries, littler well, uh, smaller countries. It's kind of ridiculous because they're going to do it anyway. We look at one of the things that actually contradicts this argument is the France and the UK have both reduced their defense spending in the light of their acquisition of nuclear weapons because they no longer need them to defend the homeland. The UK spends about $45 billion a year per annual on defense, whereas if they didn't have nuclear weapons, they'd be spending a lot more, like they did in your World War I area example that you brought up earlier. So we talked about waste. I've already kind of talked about that in terms of the money is well spent. The deterrence factor, I can't. I don't think you can say deterrence theory has failed if the fact that we're all still here and not ready to consider it. So I don't understand where you make that point. I don't understand where you get bioweapons from, because why would you use bioweapons that could kill your own people when you can just incinerate the other guy and hope he doesn't get you first? Um, that doesn't really make any sense here. Uh, why made One of the good things about nuclear weapons is that we've created an upper limit of conflict. We no longer pursue other forms of weapons. We don't look at rods from God or hyperkinetic weapons. Instead, we've reached the upper limit of what we're capable of doing with our violence of action, and we've chosen not to continue that because nuclear weapons have uh, shocked us into following a norm that's acceptable. So moving on to my positive uh, matter, I'm sorry, um, talking about those spillover benefits and the, what that means for cooperation. First off, if you have nuclear weapons, you have civilian power plants. You have a substantial infrastructure and in STEM research, so your ability to actually make those weapons instead breeds the ability to have more civilian technology non-nuclear. It's an investment in terms of what you're able to do and produce, because you need to invest in those professors, you need to invest in those people. 
contrary to popular uh, opposition theory, um, other countries don't like to just hand you nukes because you write them a check. That's usually not what they do. You need to domestically produce the weapon yourself, which requires a lot of domestic investment in your own security. But one of the things that we also get is one of the things that's going to really take down this uh, terrorism argument, non-state actor, rational actor, is there is such an intense amount of cooperation around countries and how they interact with their ability to safeguard each other's nuclear weapons. In the 1990s, when the Soviet Union collapsed, one of the first people that went in to help the Soviets maintain, or the newly Russians, maintain the nuclear stockpile was NEST teams, National Nuclear Emergency Support Teams. Everybody works together to make sure that the things that they're talking about don't happen because everybody understands that those things are terrible. So we take every major precaution to prevent that from happening, which is why it's never happened, and that's why you don't have any evidence to cite. So moving on from there, regional security benefits. When we look at what happens when nuclear weapons are present and why they do more good than harm, going back to those smaller countries, when we talk about non-possessors get a security benefit anyway. So Saudi Arabia doesn't necessarily need to have a nuclear weapon because they're under the American penumbra of being protected from nuclear strikes. And the other thing that when you start to look at that, that frees them up to spend less money on defense because now they don't have to worry about getting invaded. So countries that are proximate to Russia, for instance, like uh, Estonia. Estonia is in NATO. It's protected. It doesn't necessarily have to worry about Putin. It can spend less. And the reason why NATO is an effective threat against Russian expansionism is because of nuclear weapons. So when you see that, you really get people who don't even have nuclear weapons getting benefits. I think that's pretty good. When we look at the calculus of Armageddon, it leads to a discourse. One of the things that's really key that we need to discuss here is what happens when two states that hate each other's guts get weapons. And I'm sure we're all familiar with the India and Pakistan example. But if you think about it, India and Pakistan had three major wars before both sides got nuclear weapons. Bloody, massive conflicts over territory. Now, what is really good about nuclear weapons and territorial land grabs among its neighbors? If you nuke the place that you want, you don't get it anyway. So that forces people to have rational conversations if they don't have the ability to use conflict. India and Pakistan are not going to get in a land war over Kashmir. What they are going to do is look at each other and say, I really want to punch you in the face with this nuke, but I know you're going to do the same thing to me. We need to figure out how we're going to split the Indus River out, how we're going to get this river, how we're going to get this water. So when you look at that, you see Pakistan and India, two states that arguably hated each other more than the Soviet Union and the United States ever did. You have ethnic conflict, you have historical conflict, you have religious conflict. Right there, at the point, that is the perfect culminating point to look at why deterrence theory works. If people who hate each other so much and believe in heaven still haven't nuked each other, then that proves that deterrence theory works. So when you look at things like North Korea, I know we all hate North Korea, you know, the interview wasn't that great a movie, but however, North Korea exists today because the United States cannot invade them. That means that's a small country getting a protection benefit. Um, when you look at the United States and the USSR, it prevented a massive land war in Western Europe. We know that. Now we came close in, the Ber in Berlin with tanks pointed at each other, ready to go, ready to kill each other, but that didn't happen. Why? Because everyone knew Moscow and Washington, D.C. were going to be turned into dust if they did. That's what a direct limit on conventional conflict within that area, and that proves why they've done more good than harm. Once you look at all these things that we're bringing you today, the spillover benefits for STEM, the mutual security benefits for people who don't even have nuclear weapons, and the fact that the calculus of Armageddon, once you do have these weapons, forces to discourse, forces to peace, and creates this position of stability that is far greater than anything you get on their side of the house from, you know, pre-World War II conflict. And for this reason, we're proud to propose. Thirty, forty, fifty 50 years and think that we've actually lived in a relatively peaceful world, especially when we compare um, our world to the worlds of World War II and World War I. But the, I, I would posit that the only reason that we think we live in a world with less war, less death, is because we're sitting here in the United States of America and we don't understand uh, the factors that happen all across the world. There are multiple different types of wars and people have died in the past multiple decades and you don't actually ever see an assessment of the death toll of the individuals that die on their side of the house, number one, um, because most of them aren't living in places um, like we see over here in the West. And number two, I think there are plenty of different types of wars where people actually die in and a lot of them don't even have guns. I think we're in an age of economic war. I think we're in an age of 
political war, and people die just as easily when they're starved to death. I think people die just as easily when they don't have politically solvent governments because the United States has literally outsourced their political solvency so we can rip the natural resources out of their lands and uh, uh, benefit from them, our, from them ourselves. So before we get into the meat of our case, which is basically a critique of the entire um, framing um, or the way that uh, this side looks at their impacts, um, let's talk about the tertiary impacts. They say that we have all this research in energy, environment, and medicine. They say we have domestic jobs. Um, I think that we have actually spent in the past three decades upwards as, as a globe trillions and trillions of dollars on maintenance, production, and upkeep of nuclear weapons. If we had spent this on anything else, like name a thing we could have spent it else on, like just building monuments, we could have employed more construction workers. We could have spent it more on better, better in terms of education. We could have just like balanced debt generally, invested in eBay or something, right? And it would have been better for the world than like investing in massive, massive like hegemonic structures to like stop the massive amounts of radiation that are spilling over into Native American landmarks, right? Then they talk about this upper limit of conflict. He says, we're not building rods from God. Uh, Mike, you know that that's absolutely not true. We're absolutely building rods from God. Let me talk to you about a different way that we're trying to expand our conflict. Um, there was an ABM treaty. Um, do you remember President Bush? He took the United States off it. We're actually increasing our stockpile of ABMs. Those are anti-ballistic missiles. Missiles are able to shoot other nuclear missiles out of the ground. Why? Because the United States actually wants to be able to stop mutually assured destruction, so we have the nuclear football that's better than other people's nuclear football. We're still participating in a nuclear arms race to stop the efficacy of other individuals' nuclear arms, which is why we have more than 10,000 nukes, because we think if we can hit all of Russia's silos right at once, they will have an ability to create second strike. The actual nuclear arms race is still going on, Mr. Speaker, because as long as there's a, a weapon with the potential for a single individual that's holding the football suitcase to annihilate the entire world, an individual's gonna get drunk off that dream of power and is going to want to functionally control the way the global geopolitics works because it's a massive amount of power. He says the alternate is that we would have to have massive militaries. There is actually a country that completely gave up all their nuclear weapons and doesn't have a massive military and still exists. It's called South Africa. They've given up their, their, their nuclear weapons and they still exist functionally. They still participate in political discourse because I think liberalism does actually have the potential to solve on our side of the house, but only in a world where there are non-nuclear powers. Non-nuclear nuclear powers shift the way that geopolitics happens to such a massive degree that there is no democratic check is no, no democratic check possible for countries. We think a war without nuclear weapons is still peaceful between large scale states. There would not be a World War III, um, which is why you can't point to nuclear weapons as the reason uh, that we're all not cinders, right? There are a couple of reasons for this. Um, there actually are, are political institutions that mean that individuals are going to, number one, assess the impacts of wars large scale. I also think that democratic peace theory, um, on some level, is going to be solved in some way. And furthermore, uh, we think that economic interdependence means that the United States and Russia understand that if they both went to war, or a massive large-scale land war in lieu of nuclear weapons, it would still lead to the massive amount of degradation and impact which neither of them want to bite. Like, no one wants to bite the check of billions and millions of people dying on the eastern front of Russia because they just understand that that's not a cost that they want to bear. There are, there are different ways that we can fight wars in the status quo, and there are proxy wars, there are smaller wars, there are economic wars, small battles that we fight politically and economically. This is the way that we fight wars in the modern world. But um, we think that in a post-nuclear world, it's actually to a massive expansion of Western hegemony, right? Um, so what are we talking about here? We're talking about proxy wars, we're talking about economic exploitation, we're talking about arms length conflicts like drone strikes. There have actually been like multiple thousands of them that we don't even recognize here because we think we live in a relatively peaceful world where we're actually killing tens of thousands of people all over the world. We say that the impacts are smaller only because we're sitting in these seats. We think the war machine of the West is driven by increment, incrementalism and we're actually trying to imperialize other areas of the world in more subtle ways, controlling them politically and via the proxy of their existing governments delegitimizing them. We think the entire globe has become delegitimized because there are two types of countries in the post-nuclear world. There are nuclear powers, there are non-nuclear powers. There are powers that have the ability, if they create a coalition, a, a coalition of a small group of people that actually have political power, to annihilate vast portions of the global population. This potential means that these countries are always going to have a significantly higher ability to engage in particular types of political discourse. The only reason that the political discourse that these you guys say was actually a good thing that happened between India and Pakistan was, was because both of these countries had nuclear weapons. Let's talk about a political discourse between the United States and Africa. 
Do we assess one? Do we care about genocide in Africa? Absolutely not. Why? Because no one in Africa actually has an ability to reach out and touch the United States. What would happen if the United States went to war with the continent of Europe, Mr. Speaker? Who would lose? Who has more news? On our side of the house, it's us. You know, the continent of Europe doesn't have an ability to actually push back against aggressive United States action. Why is this actually important? Because we think in a world where there aren't nuclear weapons, it forces uh, the legitimacy of democratic institutions like the United Nations. When all countries have somewhat of, somewhat of an uh, increased parity of power, um, we think that the dream of true liberalism is possible. If, if there are countries that can come together via coalition, we think there's a natural democratic, I'll take you, Mike, you are. Okay, so uh, the idea that we had this thing before nuclear weapons that was just like the United Nations called the League of Nations and did nothing to make small countries just as powerful as big countries, how does that even make sense? All right, the League of Nations, the United States didn't sign off the League of Nations. It's a bad example, number one. Number two, we live in a more global world where there's no more economic independence via more globalization. Um, I think that this world, that the worlds you're talking about are completely disanalogous. I also have much better links than that. And if, I, if I think that if you're going to actually resonate either that solves, you need to do my response to why the United States is stockpiling more um, ABMs, um, because that's just a complete fly, that completely um, empirically defeats your argument, right? Um, so this can't work. Like, if, think of it as a voting system. A voting system doesn't actually actually work in terms of legitimacy if a couple of the voters, a small minority, have the ability to kill the rest of the individuals. I think that we actually have a far more democratic, globally speaking world. It might be a world where the United States has less power, but I think that world is actually a much better world because there are excesses in United States policy or even Russian policy that I think that could be countered by coalitions of other countries that actually have an ability to respond politically. The way that we can't respond in a post-nuclear world is because those countries don't have nuclear weapons, which is why the nuclear arms race is still happening, nuclear proliferation is still happening, even for the countries that already have the nuke, because they're trying to get more nukes from the other people's nukes with all this bad thing. So just to start off the speech and contextualize where I think we're coming from the closing government, consider what we heard from the last speaker when he talks to you about the power dynamics that exist within the status quo, and he tells you that, in effect, in a world without nuclear weapons, what we would have is a world with increased power parity, where individuals can come together, as they do in the United Nations, but perhaps in a more fair way, and actually talk about their problems. There's one big issue to this. The world without nuclear weapons is exactly the one that existed before World War I. It's exactly the one that existed even after World War I and before World War II, before the invention of the nuclear weapon. It is to say that it is always the case that even if a country might not have an increased nuclear stockpile, it might not have more nukes than you do in absolute terms, the fact is that if they are still more powerful than you, they can take what they want. And this is the fundamental problem that you have to engage with with the opening, or with just opposition as a whole, which I think you get, or from which I think you get very tangible benefits for the government side here today. When we talk about deterrence theory, when we talk about why we think mutually assured destruction works, we do so in a world in which individuals who are less powerful actually have a voice to speak in because they understand that they are under the general umbrella and protection of other nuclear nations, or in which they have some kind of link to a nuclear power that makes it so that they have legitimate voice. All that we do within the status quo, when we talk about nuclear stockpiles, when we have a United Nations Security Council that is comprised of individuals who, or of individual nations who have nuclear weapons, is recognize the real politic. That is to say that these individuals have more power. They are just, like, in absolute terms, more powerful countries with the asymmetric ability to overthrow others. We think that in the case especially of the United States and of Russia, of China, this would be no less true if they did not have nuclear weapons in the first place. But we think that what you do get out of Mike's speech and out of government side as a whole, which contrasts with what we heard from the opposition, actually does demonstrate to us why nuclear weapons as they exist give us more harm than good. Not only because we think that you actually get less conflicts, like we talked to you about, in, at, or rather, of the nature of World War II, but because we think that those wars in and of themselves are better than the proxy wars that Krieger talks to you about. But, and more importantly, because we think that there are actually tangible benefits to the creation of nuclear weapons that recognize political instabilities and dynamics as they exist and make it so that actually more or greater imbalances in power are actually brought uh, into greater balance by the existence of nuclear powers. So I broadly have two questions of crystallization that I think speak to what my partner talked to you about and clarify this round quite well. So one, what are the spillover benefits to nuclear weapons? And secondly, what are just the benefits of nuclear weapons in their own right? 
I think if I can show you these two points, why there are definitely tangible benefits that elevate above what we heard out of the opposition, you're going to be giving the ballot to government here today. Uh, sure, before we go on into actually talking about any of that stuff, I'll take you, Landon. Cool, thank you, Mike. So uh, it seems like they're, they're not analogous to this figure. And were we not to have nuclear weapons right now, we would not be in the World War I situation. We now have a collective security institution deeply ingrained in international relations that is the United Nations. The League of Nations did not have a U.S. That is the, the avenue for peace. Nuclear weapons are an avenue for peace. But that exact same collective avenue of cooperating around nuclear weapons and around the power that these nations have give, first of all, credence to the United Nations in the first place, but secondly, actually create the global security net that means that first opposition falls by the wayside in this debate. Here's what I mean by that. In a world in which, individ which individual nations and individual actors value their nuclear weapons and would do well to, one, protect the uranium, two, probably protect the scientists who are making and enriching the uranium, and three, protecting the nuclear weapons themselves through every reasonable means within their power. A world in which we value nuclear weapons is something that are actually good and beneficial in a world where the knowledge of nuclear weapons exists means that we get less war and are less likely to have the kinds of terror, uh, the terrorist scenario where a terrorist gets hold of a nuclear weapon in our world where we actually do value nuclear weapons. The reason being, we think that in the existence of a power vacuum, was there, were there not nest cooperations, were there not groups of individuals who were specifically instituted to stop nuclear proliferation from these irrational actors that they talk to you about? We think that all of these speak to actually reasons why countries do value their nuclear weapons, and why we think the existence, maybe not why we think the existence of nuclear weapons in and of itself is good, but why we think that very generally, the existence of this nuclear weapon as like the ultimate uh, bright line in what we are willing and what we are comfortable in producing in terms of mass indiscriminate warfare means that nuclear weapons exist as a bright line and that in and of itself is a good thing. We think that the deterrence effect matters in as much as we aren't building like rods of God. We aren't building massive weapons to systematically and indiscriminately wipe out not just entire cities anymore but entire nations. The reason why we don't do that is because we have nukes. But that's not really what I want to talk about. I want to talk more about what, like, what the actual spillover benefits are before I talk about these things. So the spillover benefits that we talked to you about are, first of all, just the creation of nuclear energy. Like, we think the existence of nuclear weapons within the status quo, which parlayed into the types of research and development that led to nuclear power, which is ultimately cleaner and a lot better for the civilians, means that even if they can come up here and talk to you about the disaster pulling calculus, about how Chernobyl was so, was so terrible, they don't actually weigh the comparative of, of when that exists in a world when we are burning a ton of fossil fuels every single day, when we are polluting the environment in exactly terrible, in the same terrible ways, if not in actual worse ways. They don't actually deal with the comparative that tells you that nuclear weapons, and especially nuclear power as it exists, is good because the comparative, the status quo when we burn these fossil fuels, is bad. All that they tell you is that Chernobyl happened, and that Chernobyl was bad. And while we don't necessarily disagree, we think that the rational calculus of uh, we think the rational calculus within this round would tell us that we would prefer one Chernobyl to the actual continued propagation of the destruction of our environment via fossil fuels. But even that's not as super important in this round. The benefits of nuclear weapons and the tangible ones that Mike brings to you are, first of all, just like the mutual security benefits that we talked to you about. Like, we think those are good in that we think that, one, actors, when both sides have nukes, actually reach cooperations over contested territory. India and Pakistan is a great example of this. But secondly, that when countries are just making the calculus of Armageddon, even against countries that they are more powerful than, uh, or that they are less powerful than. They have to always consider the nuclear question and whether or not this Armageddon will happen. So we think that the existence of that threat in the mind of these individuals is actually beneficial. Before I get into protected time, go ahead. Yeah, you talked about all these spillover benefits and how nuclear energy has helped us, right? But we, we do really need to understand that nuclear energy is not used as a substitute to fossil fuels at present. Fair enough, but we think that the application of nuclear technology and other research and development would be beneficial. If you guys want to talk about the future, so can we. So, secondly, what are, in terms of what the actual benefits of nuclear weapons are, we would tell you that the benefits of nuclear weapons, first of all, exist like in just what I talked about, the actual existence of nuclear weapons in negotiations between two parties where both have nuclear weapons. In India and Pakistan, we think this led to actual good discourse and less war over conflicts, particularly uh, with the Kashmir region. But secondly, we think the benefits of nuclear weapons exist even independent of a world in which, just like the United States is uh, enacting these arms, these arms length wars, just like in a world where everybody has nuclear weapons. We think that the ability of individuals to exist in a penumbra or to exist under the protection of other nuclear powers means that you have essentially outsourced the need for arms development in and of itself. So Saudi Arabia gets to spend less on defense spending because it understands that it's under the United States protection. Ultimately, when weighing this round, you have to recognize the situation in the real politique. Like we recognize that individual nations have power or are given power by their association with other nuclear powers. And at the point at which we think that the irrational actor that does away with mutually assured destruction isn't Kim Jong-un, we don't know who it's actually going to be. We think that nuclear weapons, as they have existed, do good. We think that they will continue to do good, and certainly more good than harm.
around this bit. Um, so, firstly, uh, my first question of two is which side of the house uh, has more lives saved? Uh, I think it's appropriate given the model. Um, and secondly, uh, which side has more lives lost? I think also appropriate given the model. Um, so, let's get into the first one. Um, so, we brought to you on our side of the house uh, two main thrusts on this, on this side of my two part speech. Um, we said, number one, uh, we have a great uh, uh, opportunity cost that is lost when we invest all of our money, or at least half of it, uh, it's really not even counted in the defense budget because it's ultimately endless, uh, of how much money we put into nuclear weapons, right? Uh, any nation has this problem. You lose things uh, like re research in energy, like research in medicine and disease. Think of all of the people who have AIDS in Africa who could have stayed alive had we found a cure by now, or had we found a way to give it to them, right? Like, these are all things that uh, Mike just simply decided not to address, right? Like, so he brought up other costs, we think that these are a lot of lives uh, that you need to be weighing in your flow. Uh, so secondly, we think also that no response to the ABM productions the article <coughs> analysis that Creekor brought to you, uh, probably also written down in your flow. We think that uh, the, the uh, amount of money that we have given to our ABM productions uh, in the last 10 years is so grossly overspent uh, when given the nature of our other problems within our society that we probably could have been spending money on. It could only mean that the threat is probably serious between us and Russia, right? Like, why are we allocating so much of our money between our, for our ABM production and weapons defenses against uh, you know, nuclear weapons if we really ultimately buy their argumentation that it's really not a problem? It's really not going to happen, uh, you know, because we have so many nukes, uh, nuclear weapons will ultimately never happen. I think that's just like logically something that you simply can't stand on. Uh, secondly, let's get into how liberalism solves. No analysis here whatsoever. I don't even, I don't even hear democratic peace, uh, economic interdependence, like those are like the buzzwords in, in VP nature. Uh, so firstly, let's get into how liberalism solves. We think that the South African example is something that's pretty key here, also never mentioned. Didn't hear that in Asia. Uh, so why is this ultimately uh, something that we need to be, you need to be weighing in your adjudication though, Mr. Speaker? We think that we would not have had a World War III nukes or not, right? We think we didn't have a nuke, uh, World War III yeah. because number one, we saw the atrocities of World War II. I would tell you that a lot of people died in the firebombings of Tokyo though, uh, just compared to uh, the nuclear weapons as well. But I think the ultimate uh, reason that we didn't do it was because of liberalism of values, Mr. Speaker. We think that we had things like institutions, like the United Nations, which the U.S. got on board with, right, and a collective security established. We didn't have a, a collective security institution prior to World War I. So by Mike telling you that it's ultimately analogous, he's ultimately wrong. Uh, so now let's get into the second one. Uh, how economic interdependence is ultimately more valuable here in our, in our, uh, in our new world. We think that we have a system of globalization, so as long, as far back as you can trace globalization, that's as long as far back as you could have traced peace, right? Because we think that the more people uh, are economically tied with one another, the less likely they are to go to war with that person. It simply doesn't make sense for you to blow up the people that are buying all of your goods, right? It just doesn't make sense to us. Uh, and so we think that ultimately, though, uh, we have a shared democratic norms between nations, right? We have shared uh, democratic values between uh, our, our democracies. But what is uh, functionally being forgotten within this debate, Mr. Speaker, is what are the effects on the people that aren't like us? What are the people, the effects that don't live like us, that don't live here? We think that that is completely dropped on their side of the case, and so far as it is, they lose. Let's get into the second question. Which side has more lives lost? We think that uh, their deterrence theory ultimately fails and is going to fail, right? So like when they say like, you know, it hasn't happened yet, therefore it won't ever happen, that's also a logical fallacy. You can't prove something in the future because of past, uh, past analysis. And so we think that ultimately, what, why might it happen, Mr. Speaker? The production of ABMs, production of, 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 of a destruction of the second strike capabilities. Russia, Vladimir Putin has openly said that our production of ways to shoot down their nukes is basically uh, our demonstration of our willingness to be offensive with our nukes, right? So like, and so far as he believes that if we launch nukes into them, that he can't launch them back, then he thinks that we're going to launch nukes into them, right? Because like, if, if, then if he launches them back, we can just shoot them down. So what does that mean? It means Russia is less safe which means that we're less safe, right? Because Russia believes that they should probably strike first. It's a security dilemma, it's a basic analysis I can teach you a little bit more if I wanted to. Uh, let's get into the second one. Uh, economic and political war. We think that we have a problem insofar as uh, we have completely forgotten uh, the, the nature of what conflict looks like uh, in the vast majority of the world, right? So like, conflict to us might look like nuclear war. Conflict to a lot of other people looks a lot different. Whether you die by a nuke or you die by an AK-47 or a machete, death is death, Mr. Speaker, and we need to be considering those deaths. Uh, so what, what happens when you have nuclear weapons uh, proliferated within society? We think that we have uh, a lot of the populations forgotten. We think that we have uh, African nations uh, largely being uh, skirted by the wayside uh, and because we are high, we're, mo we're mostly concerned about the issues of higher politics, right? Because like what's happening between the nuclear nations? What's the exchange in the United Nations between the nuclear nations? 
We think insofar as we didn't have if we didn't have nuclear weapons, we would be forming more coalitions in the United Nations and collective security actions. We would be forming uh, we would be talking more with those nations rather than simply like reaping them of all of their uranium and reaping them of their resources and, and robbing them of uh, of things of value in their nation. Insofar as we're pursuing some higher end that is like our ultimate destruction because of nuclear weapons. Okay, but Landon, the UN has never stopped a conflict. They didn't stop the Rwanda genocide. They didn't stop the Yugoslavian conflict. They didn't stop the Falklands War. They didn't stop Vietnam. They didn't stop Korea. They didn't do any of those things, and those were non-nuclear conflicts with the exception of Korea. Right, Mike, that's the problem. The problem is that we believe that international relations is a system of nuclear powers. International relations should not have been that way. Had yes. nuclear weapons not been proliferated, it probably wouldn't have been that way. We would have valued death as death as, a, as opposed to spending all of our money and resources on, plur on proliferating our own nuclear weapons programs in, in order to somehow protect the world with our nuclear security blanket. We think that those conflicts might have been prevented insofar as we value things uh, like propagating other democracies as opposed to uh, propagating other authoritarian in those nations, right? As opposed to uh, funding rebellions through proxy wars with other nations, as opposed to directly engaging them in a nuclear war. We think all of these things are consequences uh, of being either a nuclear or non nuclear state, as Krikor brought to you. We think that uh, the disruption of liberal institutions can largely be traced back to nuclear weapons as well, Mr. Speaker. We think this wasn't an, uh, 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 something in their analysis. Uh, but we think that the Mike's point and, and uh, the Mike's point back there, uh, their ultimate like their, their case relies on whether or not there would have been a World War III had a no, uh, had there been no nuclear weapons. We think, Mr. Speaker, there wouldn't have been. We think that on our side of the house, not only would there not have been such a nuclear war, we think also we would have probably been able to avoid a lot of other conflicts through our uh, collective security institutions because we would have cared more about those, right? If you look at an analysis of the United Nations during the Cold War, it was basically a discourse between what's Russia doing and what's the United States doing. Why? Because they have nuclear weapons, Mr. Speaker, that those powers should not be placed at such a higher level over all of the other nations, right? And all the other nations now have a perverse incentive to say, well, guess what? If I want to be like them, I probably need to go get nuclear weapons, right? And so I think it's ultimately like, why are we encouraging this for these nations? We should be encouraging them to use the peace means because peace means that we're not going to die from it. If they go for, for nuclear weapons, there's always that potential. You have to weigh that in the cost. I'll send it to Jay. Yeah, thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. What? Yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave it on. things that have actually happened rather than potential. Because nobody ever contests that. So ultimately that becomes my decision making criteria at the end of the round. And the only ones that's showing clear benefits for me throughout the round is going to be the team from Loyola and Mount that, that I that we agreed is the first team. The reason and, and then I'll go in reverse. The reason that the the other Loyola and Marymount team ends up this fourth is there are so many internal contradictions in your argumentation sure. that I I have a real problem. I mean, for, and the two that really struck out for me, struck to me was where you say that 
The reason the U.S. ignores Africa is, but they is they don't have any nukes to earn a place at the table. Which is, and if your if your argument is that we need to have these dialogues, and without nukes you don't get to have the dialogue. That contradicts your entire position. And then the last speech, in back-to-back -back sentences, you said you cannot prove the future, and then you turn to the ABMs and how that proves that there will be first strikes and lives lost. And, <laughs> and so there's those kind of logical inconsistencies. That, and then, I mean, those are the two for me, and then I'll let the other speakers Slide just, over, slide over. Okay. Yeah, I guess, well, for you guys, I have the exact same thing. I South Africa, I wrote This Does Not Make Sense. And then after the future thing, I have the year shifting here. So I think that's where that decision came in. For your team, um, I think one of the strongest arguments that I really liked was that irrational actors are not going to care about mutually assured destruction. I think that that was a pretty strong argument. I also think that you guys are just like very good speakers in general. Um, so that stood out to me. I think that um, the suicide bombers was also a good extrapolation on that for up there. Um, I like your personal narrative that you used at the beginning and the structure you used. Um, yes. I think that your overall arguments are pretty clear and make sense with your um, World War II examples and your setup of these research structures. Let me, let me hitchhike up one thing that Allison is saying. In terms of when you're talking about irrational actors, what would strengthen your position a great deal is every time MAD comes up, MAD is entirely contingent on rational actors. And if you frame your argument that way, it completely defeats the argument of MAD when you put rational actors at the table. Just as a, as a future, different future. Mm -hmm. Emily, you want to add? Yeah. Um, okay. okay, so for the team, uh, for the second guy in the team, um, I really liked your speech. I mean, um, Specifically, the spillover benefits about like increasing infrastructure and that's how that that's key to like invest in things along those lines and like on nuclear technology. I really like that argument a lot. Um, also, like on the, the second one was like cool, but like the third one I also liked about like the calculation of Armageddon and how like these individuals like they like they don't like each other, but that forcing of discourse like I thought that was really good because like. Again, when it like came back and like it was like you know brought up again about like the practicality of it, like yeah, you may not like it, but discourse is probably good, and nukes at least get you to the table where if you don't otherwise you just like kind of like just throw a fit about it. So I like that argument, and then I liked how um, specifically um, like the nuclear energy argument that you kind of articulated out of your, yours and like the increase in destruction uh, without nuclear energy and things along those lines. I like that argument. Um, you're sassy and I love it. Embrace it. It's awesome. Um, and I was like, I root for you more. Like, it was great. Um, just like, like, as a casual. But um, also, um, on that argument about, like, yeah, mad only works for you, like, rational actors, and it, like, mad forces, like, um, increased escalation or war. Um, those were really nice. I really liked how you kind of, like, just sat on it for a little bit and explained it out. Um, on your team, um, the argument, sorry. On your team about the argument about like spurred environmental medicinal like research and how like radioactivity and how like yeah fear but like it motivates like energy research and stuff like that. I really really like those arguments. Um, I wanted to like go with you guys on the trillions of dollars that are spent on a heap of nukes. Like could have been better elsewhere, but at the point at which everybody's like, let's look at the practicality of what's been going down lately. I I can't look at that. So at that point, yeah, that's how I look. Congratulations to all of you. Thanks for judging. I'm in the video. Can I switch it over? So um, now, now reframe your calculus from their judging. I can't. You can't. I, I, I would simply yeah. Maybe they could have the video. I, I don't know. 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 I don't
Well, just a minute. Congratulations. That was good. Uh, this will, um, this, this is what I mean by this will carry you, your persona and your arguments. But, I mean, he has some, he'll have some good critique and he will have some good critique. I thought, I thought the, the same. Oh, let me try to turn this stupid thing.